The Pemberton Valley is a place by itself, locked in by the mountains a hundred miles north of Vancouver. Spring is here very suddenly. Overnight, the skunk cabbage is flowering and the pussy willow is in bloom. The snow has begun to melt from the mountains and the ice thaws on the Lillooet River. What had been a week or two before, a still white landscape, is now a river filling its banks. The Pemberton Valley is like a long, thin slice taken out of the mountains. It has one road which runs all the way from the head of the valley to the town of Pemberton. On this afternoon in May, the school bus is making its daily trip. Birds are singing in the trees. Farmers have begun their plowing. And the air is suddenly warm with spring. has only one more stop to make. The last four passengers are the children of Lukey and Doris Van Beam. Hey, Lucille, your book. Thanks, Jack. This film is about the Pemberton Valley in springtime, and partly about these children. Four distinct and determined personalities. Elaine and Vern are foster children. They've been with the Van Beams less than a year, but already they behave like true brother and sister. Even their fighting is an expression of love for the comradeship and freedom they didn't have before. Lucille is the oldest daughter, and being the oldest, she reserves the right to spank the bottom of anyone who doesn't behave. Julia was at the age of dreaming and of being apart. Julia isn't angry with her brother and sister. She only wants to be alone for a time, because in being alone, she can express to herself better all the random thoughts of a young girl growing into adolescence. And the horses, Tilly and Jean, are a willing audience. I think. He said he'd like to have you take the salt and minerals down to the calves today. Today? I thought we were supposed to do that tomorrow, Mom. Hey, Vern! Vern! Guess what we've got to do today? A ride down the back road on a warm spring afternoon. It wouldn't occur to either Vern or Lucille to complain very much about their chores. Taking salt and minerals down to the calves is part of their everyday work. On the farm, a child learns to take an adult view of his responsibilities. Lucille, as the oldest, feels this responsibility the most. Vern sees it as a challenge to be grown up like his sister and a good farmer like his foster father. Sometimes the effort to be grown up is too great. For Vern at 10 years is a very complicated person. His life before he came to the Van Beams was unhappy and uncertain. Now that he's part of a family, among people he can trust, some of the tension has gone. The barriers are coming down, and his own playful and affectionate nature 
is beginning to show through. Lucille, will you marry me? Oh, Vern, cut it out and go and get the calves. Okay. Lucille's chiding comes easily to her as one who knows her place in the family and likes it. Elaine's chores are mostly housework. She was raised in the city and came to the Van Beams only six months ago. She's 14 and beginning to be aware that she's pretty. Like Julia, she can escape in her work to another world, the world of her past life, perhaps. Nobody knows quite what she thinks about it. And yet she's more outgoing than Julia. It is easier for her to mix with people. And like Vern, she calls Mrs. Van Beam Doris. Where's Julia, Elaine? I don't know, Doris. What are you doing, Julia? I'm cleaning up my room. Okay. Julia, making her bed, is really only half thinking about what she's doing. She moves automatically as in a dream. It isn't that her mind is fixed clearly on something else. She seems rather to be roaming in her imagination from one thought to another. A teenage characteristic, you say. Perhaps, but especially a characteristic of Julia. Yes, it's difficult to keep your mind on one thing at a time. But in the pages of a magazine, there's a life of fantasy quite apart from the life she knows, the everyday life of school and of farm. And to Julia, it looks tremendously attractive. In the barnyard, a soft breeze comes down the valley. The animals graze in the stillness of early evening. This is the last light of day, when everything looks strangely bright. The farm buildings cast their long shadows, and the animals move slowly. never seen a cow. Now he drives them into the barn for milking as if he'd worked with them all his life, and with all the authority and command of his ten years. This is the Vern who sees himself in the years to come as a good farmer, with acres of potatoes in the ground, five or six horses to ride, and a large herd of respectful and obedient cows. This is their father, Lukey Van Beam. Did you salt and mill at the cast today, Lucille? Dad, those cows have got so much salt, it's running out of their ears. That's good, that's good. Running out of their ears? Yes, running out of their ears. Lukey is tired. He's been across the river all day cutting poles. 
telephone poles for the BC Electric. It may seem a strange occupation for a farmer, but the price of potatoes this year is low, and the money from cutting poles is good. Yet potatoes has been the one big crop of the Pemberton Valley ever since the place was settled. The potato crop is the farmer's calendar. Lukey has to begin plowing tomorrow and planting next week. And all the time, the daily work of the farm goes on. Hey, Dad, are we going to the rodeo this year? Yes, luckily every other year, Lucio. It's on the 20th this year. Yeah, on the 20th. Maybe Roger Leo will be riding. Well, I've got an awful lot to do yet before the 20th. Are you going to begin plowing tomorrow? Yes, I'm a day behind now. Once the fellow's behind, he'll never catch up. Once the fellow's behind, he'll never catch up. Lukey won't let himself get behind. He's too good a farmer, and he knows the land too well. He's worked this soil for 30 years, ever since he came here as a young immigrant farmer from Java, knowing nothing of the language or the country. In his first years in Pemberton, he cleared all this ground by hand. He was known as the wild man of Borneo, for in those days, Lukey had a temper, and he always said exactly what he thought. But he's mellowed since then, and last year, he was elected president of the Farmers Institute. Age and experience have given Lukey the respect and confidence of all his neighbors. This soil has been worked many times and has given up some good potatoes. Some of the farmers farther down the valley have already done their plowing, but the frost is slower to leave the ground up here. And now Lukey has to hurry to get the plowing done and the crop into the ground. For time and the weather are always the farmer's enemies. Yes, we expect Robert to drive the tractor. Mm-hmm. Do you suppose you would come a little early, Noreen, to help me get started? Very good. Fine. Well, we'll see you Monday then, Noreen. Thanks a lot. Bye now. Mom, is, is it okay if I put my bathing suit on? Your bathing suit, Julia? What do you, uh, I thought you were going to do your homework. I am. I'm going to go up the island and read. Well, are Eileen and Lucille over there swimming? Yes, they're over there, and Bryn's over there, too. Yes, yes, I guess so. Thank you, Mom. shoot of hay and a salmon belly leaf. Julia is on her way to do homework, but there are so many other things to study.
Spring is a time of discovery. These things Julia has looked at year after year before. But now she suddenly sees them. Now her walk through the woods has become a voyage into a strange land. And she doesn't know why she feels happy and sad at the same time. sunshine has warmed the waters of the salmon slough, and for Vern it makes up for a cold winter and the months of tramping knee-deep in the snow. Everybody feels this release, even the dog. Spring has come tumbling out of the mountains and touched these children with its exuberance. In their clowning and splashing, there is no self-consciousness, no embarrassment. Their play is as simple as an animal's. How many of us would not like to be as free and as uncomplicated and as happy as this. Happiness is not an idea that a child thinks about very much. It is only an adult looking on who says, this child is happy, or this child is sad. Or who looking back says, then I was happy, or I was never happier in my whole life. But the child, even a child as grown up as Lucille, already half in the adult world, only knows the sun and the water and the bright trees and gives himself completely to them all. Julia, in her way, is just as happy. Without really knowing it, she too is responding to the shouts and the laughter and the splashes. And she's entirely at peace with her world. sure a dirty job. I like to keep as much dust out of my hair as possible. You, you should do the same as I do. Just put one layer of dirt on top of the other and you don't notice it. <laughs> well, let's go. I thought you were still asleep. Hmm. That's what you think. Well, Socks, are you ready? Yes, about as ready as I'll ever be, I guess. Thank you, Noreen. You're welcome, Doris.
It'll take Lukey and Doris and Noreen Shires and Robert Kay five or six days to finish planting. They ride to the field as if out for a picnic, but planting is no picnic. By the end of the week, they will have put 30 acres under cultivation. These people take potatoes seriously. Their children grow up knowing every kind and variety there is. Spuds with poetic names like White Rose, Netted Gems, Epicure, Early Rose, and Green Mountain. They take great pride in the fact that a Pemberton potato has won a world championship two different years. They study the catalogs for pictures of new equipment. The potato is king in Pemberton. And if the prices are bad, as they have been this year, the farmer mutters darkly about turning to some other crop. But most of them never will. One of the great advantages of the farmer's life, people tell us, is that he can work outdoors, and how pleasant and healthy that can be. For the Van Beams and their neighbors, it often is. But planting requires too much concentration for them, even to be aware of the beauties of nature. Each one of them is tremendously intent on his own job, the women in their cutting, Lukey in feeding the pieces, and Robert in driving slowly and absolutely straight. Planting is hard work. And after a few hours, it seems as if they've been doing it all their lives. row after row, and field after field. On it goes to the long shadows of late afternoon, and tomorrow, and the next day, and the day after. Noreen sure was tired today, wasn't she? Well, the first day's always the hardest. Yes. I guess you're on your first million now, Daddy. My first million? Or what? Spuds or dollars? If it's spuds, I should have seen them a long time ago. Well, it sure isn't dollars, anyhow. Well, the farmer sure ain't, ain't making any money this year. Oh, no, but what the heck, we still have the cutting of poles to fall back on. Oh, sure. 
Well, I guess I better check the gates. Okay, Daddy. The farm is Lukey Van Beam's life, and it always will be. Hard work, never sure of his markets, never sure whether some freak of weather or disease will reduce all his work to nothing. But there's something that others will envy, his independence, the security of his home and family, his closeness to living and growing things. In fact, all the wholesome virtues that we are becoming too embarrassed to talk about anymore. When planting is over, there is always something else to do. This afternoon, Lukey is taking his Model A into Pemberton to buy a weed killer at the co-op. It's a small town. About all you can see on this street are a few houses, a machine shop, a garage, a store, and the hotel. And this is the main street. But it's big enough to handle the business of the valley, which has a population of about 500, as well as another four or 500 Indians living on the reserve at Mount Curry, six miles away. At this time of day, Pemberton is quiet. The freight to Prince George passed through half an hour ago, and the only activity on the whole street, apart from Lukey, is a little boy, off on some urgent mission to the store. office, Eric Geffen is trying to make some sense out of his account books. In his slow and quiet way, Eric is one of the most important people in the valley, for the co-op speaks for all the farmers. His office is like Eric himself, comfortable, smoky, and a little cluttered. Morning, Lukey. What can I do for you this morning? Hi, Eric. I would like some wheat killer. You got anything new this year? Well, there's weed killers for all different kinds of purposes. There's uh, weed killer for broadleaf plants, uh, weed killer for uh, narrowleaf plants, the selective, and uh, also non-selective, those that uh, only kill a certain types of plants, and we also have... Uh, Lukey is going to have to wait for a while before he gets a chance to tell Eric what kind of weed killer he wants. Uh, spot killing for, say, Canada Thistle. The Pacific Great Eastern Railway, its whistles and horns have echoed through this valley for 40 years. For a very long time, it was almost a joke. Its service was so bad, and its cars smoky and uncomfortable. The people of Pemberton would have laughed more often if they had not been so dependent on it. For there is no other way in or out of the valley. 
the PGE, sometimes nicknamed the Please Go Easy, was and still is the lifeline from Vancouver to northern British Columbia. But now, in the last year, the passenger trains have become sleek new cars, and they're even beginning to run on time. Now there's a kind of reluctant pride in the old PGE. Soon they will have two passenger trains a day, one up and one down. When they arrive, there's a brief flurry of activity, and then everything's quiet again. Let's leave Lukey with Eric and the weed killer. We'll be seeing him later on May Day at the rodeo. This is Roger Leo. He's 15 years old and he's Indian. He rides into town from Mount Curry every afternoon. There's a train to pick up his papers. Roger is one of the few Indian schoolboys who also has a job. Roger does not feel comfortable in Pemberton. Like most Indians, he's shy and reserved with members of the white race, shy even among his own people. Pemberton is not unfriendly to its Indians, but there is the barrier between races. And on the other side of that barrier, the Indian always takes second place. Mrs. Leo has a large family to watch for. Roger is the oldest, and there are four sisters and one brother, the youngest. Adolf Leo, their father, is at work this afternoon, logging. They live in the newer part of the reserve, and their house is perhaps a little better than the average. They've just built an addition onto it, because children keep coming, and they need more space. This family, like the Van Beams, lives very closely together with a strong and simple sense of loyalty to one another. What Roger does is of great interest to his sisters. Lorraine can read, of course, and make some sense out of the papers. But in many ways, the Daily News might as well be a storybook to these children. So remote is it from what they know. Once the front page has been scanned for pictures, the next thing is to help Roger by folding the papers the way they've been taught and putting them in his sack. And having helped speed Roger on his way, his sisters are sorry to see him go. Although he doesn't look it, Roger's horse, Robin Hood, is 16 years old. Roger is proud of him. For many years, he was one of the best horses in the village. He's won many races in his day. And perhaps next week, at the rodeo, he'll win another. This is what an Indian village is like. Children who have not yet learned that the world is larger than Mount Curry. The world they read about in school, the world outside, has no reality for them yet. These children who play among the old barns of the rancheria ask for very little. Only when they get to Roger's age do they begin to question who they are and what they are to do. Meanwhile, the village sleeps in its own good time and no one is in a hurry.
A greeting between two young Indians is often as shy as this. A feeling of not trespassing on the other's personality. It's a kind of unwritten code of politeness that has a great deal to do with pride. This is the old village. In the early days, Mount Curry was called Creekside. The change of name has made no difference to the people who live there. And this part of the reserve looks much the same as when it was built, like some early photograph of a frontier town. How disturbing it is to some people that the Indians don't seem to do anything. But is this so bad? Would they be happier working to buy a refrigerator? Some of the younger ones think so. There are those in the band who feel that the Indian must advance to survive, that he must get an education and look for the day when he can compete on equal terms with the white man. And there are others, the older ones, who are proud of their traditions and resent any efforts to change them. The pattern of life is quiet on this reserve, but the Indian is changing. The old people are dying away, the old natives who can still remember when the first white men came to the valley. And the younger ones will take their place and go out into the world with all its pains and troubles and try to live a new life. Roger has finished his papers, and now he's taking Robin Hood out for a ride. Or is it the other way around? This is Roger's country. He has never known any other. And because he knows it well, he loves it. These fields and trails and creeks have been his playground for 15 years. His ancestors shot deer in these woods, picked berries on the mountains, and let their animals run free. They took their possession for granted, for as much of the world as they could see was their own. Now times have changed. The fields and the trees and the grass have been given to the Indians. They are no longer theirs by right. Roger will be leaving all this in a little while. In June, he will be graduated from grade eight, and the school in Mount Curry doesn't go any higher. Roger is a good student, and his teacher wants him to go to Williams Lake next year, where there's an Indian high school. It means being away from home for the first time, meeting strange people. Roger is not looking forward to it, but he knows it is the right thing to do.
the spring air has wafted down the valley. And under the shadow of Mount Curry, Roger and Robin Hood together embrace the sun and the wind. An old horse and a young boy, sharing the exhilaration of their power to ride over the ground as if they had wings. In this companionship, Roger is able to express better than he ever could in words why he is happy to be alive and a young Indian growing up in Mount Curry. It's nearly five, and Adolf Leo is coming home from work. It's the first day's logging he's had in a few months, but things will be better now that spring is here. Logging has made all the difference to Indians like Adolf Leo. For now, when he can get the work, the money is good. Better than he can get doing casual labor for the white farmers, and better than farming for himself. There's little incentive for the Indian to work the land he's been granted, much to the irritation of the whites who would like it for themselves. Rhoda, his eldest daughter, has been elected May Queen. Like Roger, she's shy and a little bit frightened. Roger may worry about the kind of showing he will make in the races and riding on May Day, but Rhoda has a speech to make, her installation speech as May Queen. And because Rhoda is embarrassed, her family is embarrassed for her and draws closer to her to help. The Indian may be alone in his country, but in his family there are no strangers. This is May Day, the day of the rodeo. The Indian brass band, always most cheerful at funerals, and saddest on days of rejoicing like this. For weeks, the Indians have been preparing for this celebration, and the crowd comes from all over the valley, farmers and their wives, loggers and construction workers from the camps nearby. There's a strange blend here of Indian and white customs, for they have added to their own traditions the ceremonial trappings of May 24th and the crowning of a May Queen. To them, there is no better May Day celebration anywhere in the world, and there is no rodeo more exciting. queen waves to her subjects, the old queen looks sad, and the flower girl looks as if she would rather be home in bed. Here's our old 
queen here is going to remove her crown to give her to the new one. Rhoda Leo is going to make queen this year. Rhoda she makes is. a dignified and gentle queen, and she carries herself well, because this is the moment when all eyes are upon her. Ladies and gentlemen, may this celebration be as long remembered as the beloved Queen Victoria, in whose honor, in whose honor today has been. May I again express my thanks to you and to all those who in any way have contributed to making this a success. Thank you. It has been raining all morning, but these children splash around the Maypole as intently as if it were the brightest day of spring. To us, the dance may seem a little sad, but that is because we have trained ourselves to look at things in a complicated way. We prefer our ceremonies impersonal and streamlined. But among these children, whether watching or taking part in the parade, everyone is a participant. And that feeling of belonging or closeness, that family feeling, runs through all the antics to follow. When the races begin, the spirit of competition enters. Some of the native boys take their riding seriously, Ready? like professionals. They can be seen galloping like fury over the meadows, and their horses come home steaming and exhausted. Others haven't the time or the inclination to work that hard, but they enter the race anyway, because it is a part of their manhood to do so. There is the same spirit of improvisation about the races as in everything else. The starter has to redraw the starting line because of the rain. On the sidelines, a betting booth suddenly appears, conducted by Billy Pasco, who until last year was chief of the band and is now a kind of elder statesman. Roger doesn't think he's going to win this race. Robin Hood has passed his prime. The rain makes it a little harder for the riders. So do the dogs, who invariably leap from the sidelines to chase the horses. And of course, there's always somebody's little girl who wanders out into the track in the path of the race. But after all, this is part of the fun. This day belongs to the Indian. It doesn't matter that the reason for the celebration was a queen of England who died more than half a century before. To the Indian, the celebration is reason enough for itself. And he's conscious that he's enjoying himself among his own people. When he was chief of the band at Mount Curry, 
Billy Pascoe many times said that the Indians had to live with the white man and learn his ways. They know this to be true. You must fight for equality, he said. They look at the white people in the crowd today and they are perfectly aware that behind the smiles they are regarded with a friendly contempt. They are also aware that some of the construction men who live in the nearby camps, perhaps some of them here in the crowd, have given illegitimate children to their daughters. They accept this, as they accept many things, without dwelling on it, rarely even speaking of it. The white man lives in tolerance of the Indian, and that is a long way from equality. The Indian doubts that he will ever have equality, and in the meantime, he will live with what he has. This is the real rodeo, the riding, the test of skill and courage. Here, the interest of the crowd is at its peak, for they are drawn together by one excitement, the element of danger. And even with the riding, there is the same homemade quality about this rodeo. Many of the Broncos are plow horses who find it very hard to work up enough enthusiasm to buck. And when that happens, the Indians follow the action just as intently, for they are already convinced that this is the best rodeo ever held. Roger is not so concerned about hurting himself as he is about looking bad in front of his friends. This too is part of the pride of the Indian, part of the code by which Roger is growing up. He has entered this event because it will show him to be a man. And if he carries himself well, he will be satisfied. Next week, he has turnips to plant. Still, this is a family holiday, and Lukey is a good family man. He hasn't had a chance to talk to Adolf Leo for months. The Van Beams and the Leos have known each other for many years, one of the rare cases where an Indian and a white man are close personal friends. The Van Beams and the Leos have no thought that their friendship is especially unusual. It goes back to the days when Adolf once worked for Lukey. Such a friendship comes easy because Lukey is a good man who takes people as he finds them, and because Adolf has worked with white men long enough to understand them.
The animals are turned out of the corral. May Day is over. The rain has stopped, and it's time to go home. The Leos and the Van Beans, good ordinary people who live in a country of individuals. For in the Pemberton Valley, you don't make friends easily or quickly, but when you do, you keep them. The Leos will go back to their house, Adolf will hope that the logging holds up this summer, and Roger will soon go away to school. The Van Beams will drive the 25 miles back to their farm in the old Model A, with Lukey already worrying about his turnips. Soon, the village returns to normal. Everyone is going home to dinner. Tonight, there will be a dance in the new Indian community hall, and the shouts and the laughter will echo around the streets of Mount Curry until early in the morning. Right now, they are full of today. What they saw, what they heard, whom they spoke to. In a little while, May 24th will recede into the past, into another of the days of spring. And the bright mornings of summer and the sharp blue afternoons of winter will take its place. To the children, the seasons pass more slowly. Yet, when they are as old as Lukey and Doris, and when spring comes again, they will wonder that it happened so long ago. CBC Television Network.